Issue 24. The issue starts with what's very obviously the evil twins of the Freedom Fighters going through with the boredom-inspired plan to provoke a fight with them. Honestly, other than I guess them having fun with this, I don't see the point of them going through all this trouble just to provoke a fight. All they have to do is start attacking them and they'll get their fight a lot easier. The ones who do the most heinous acts are Boomer, attacking a shop and acting like a mafia guy wanting protection money, and most tellingly, Patch, who drives really recklessly and knocks an apple stall and not whole village over because Antoine has a car apparently. We all know Antoine is old enough to drive. How can his feet even reach the gas pedal? Also, I guess I should stop pointing out that money is supposed to have no value to Eggman, because Not Hole clearly has a functioning currency system, or this guy would have no reason to bother selling apples. But back, but back to Patch. It makes perfect sense that his crime is most heinous, considering how evil his plan on Mobius will be a lot further into the comic. While it wasn't planned that way at the time, Patch being the most evil is the perfect foreshadowing, considering he becomes a literal murderer later on. It was kind of stupid of him to drive recklessly though since he risked injuring himself, which would have wrecked his plan. And since the guy just says that it must be important for him to be in such a hurry, it's clear that he's excusing his actions at first, which explains why Patch felt the need to drive into his apple stall to avoid his plan not working. But again, he sure is lucky he didn't get hurt from that. But yeah, Patch is the worst to behave, while Miles' crime is the most petty. All he does is throw tomatoes at someone. Oh no, someone threw food at you for you to eat! How dare they! It's almost as if everyone in Scourge's gang got to choose privately what evil deed they were going to do. And so what they do here is a reflection of how bad they really are. Miles could have done a lot worse than merely throwing tomatoes. I guess he was already full, so he didn't mind wasting the food. This extremely petty and minor act of evil might imply that Miles is the least evil out of all of them. I also noticed that when he calls his previous act fun and games, he puts it in quotes, as if he knew that it shouldn't be considered that. Then he meets up with the rest of his friends, who have Scourge as their leader explaining the rest of the plan. He calls them ugly sarcastically when they finally show up. I guess he does it sarcastically often enough that none of them take offense to it because he knows he's not being serious. But you'd expect gangsters to be like overly easily offended and feel like, who are you calling ugly? So it's obvious he does this sarcastically a lot. Even less than the bold meal? I'm confused about what he means by that. What's that expression mean? Plus, it's weird he's calling them jerks for no reason. I guess that gives a possible explanation for his behavior. That he's so cynical that he assumes everyone is a jerk by default. We finally get a flashback that explains how this all started. As expected, they started this plan because Scourge was bored. Same old routine. Wish I knew what that routine was. But of course we'll never be told that, even though it's such a basic thing for any villain. His room has two things of interest from what we're seeing in this panel. A picture of him looking bizarrely sad for some unexplained reason, with the words MY HERO below it. Which is weird since you'd think he'd be awkward about being called a hero. Who called him a hero? Miles? No, that'd develop his character and we can't have that. So it's gotta be Scourge complimenting himself, but again, Scourge calling himself a hero? Doesn't that go against the reputation he's trying to build for himself for no explained reason? So we got the picture of Scourge that I assume is sad because he was making a funny face, and we got a table with many names and hearts on it. It's interesting how the table having Scourge shipped with multiple girls foreshadows his cheating Casanova side later on. It also ships Sonic with Sonic, and I'm hoping that's just an expression of his ego from him, because otherwise this would be weird. I wonder how the Prime Sonic would react if he saw this. It's frustrating, his room has two of these weird details in it that they didn't have to put in there, but one of those is never properly explained, and his room doesn't have enough stuff in it to build his character properly anyways. You know, the whole point of showing a character in his room in the first place? Does he even have a TV? Scourge complains that the only time something interesting and exciting happens to him is when he bumps into Sonic, who he insults and, and throws a dart at, which what I assume is a picture of himself with his glasses off on it, because I'm not sure how he'd have a photo of Sonic. So he hates Sonic, but he just said he owes his only excitement in life to him. But he hates him. 
Scourge complains out of the window of Video Arcade. Wait, I know what arcades are, but what's a- Is a Video Arcade the same thing? Just call it an arcade, then. This might be showing that Scourge at least plays the arcade for a hobby. And Miles and Patch probably do too, since why else would they be so close to it? While seeing Patch throw away and eat into the core apple by throwing it over his shoulder in a lazy way to try and make it look evil, we see a swap bot sweeping the street with a broom with the cinema to the left of it. And there's a sign saying comics on it as well. And Scourge says that things are just too cushy around here. So the so-called evil dimension is actually much better off than every other one, because this Eggman is helpful instead of a dictator. Why is this a worse place to live again? Sure, maybe there are more mean people here, but it's always the case that most people are jerks, or at least self-centered, no matter where you go. So what's so bad about this place? This is a place where the swap bots do our work. Wait a minute, does that mean there's no jobs for the non-robots to get paid for doing? The unemployment rate's at 100%? I can't imagine people will be happy with this or be able to live at all. I hope that's not what they actually mean. And, I, and again, Scourge calls his Robotnik his arch foe, without bothering to have us told why he arbitrarily picked him as his arch foe, instead of like the a leader of a rival gang or something. And how is he a wimp when he stayed alive all this time with Scourge and his friends as his main enemies? Scourge complains, where's the challenge in that? Wait, where's the challenge in that? The Prime Sonic said that once. I just now realized this is another way where the two Sonics perfectly parallel each other. They literally had the same problem at one point. It's like even the comic knows that Scourge is a representation of what Sonic would have become if he didn't have a villain to give him an acceptable way of having excitement in his life that didn't involve crime. That this is the, what the Freedom Fires would have become if they didn't have an outlet for their stress. That they couldn't, like, they couldn't fight an actual villain, so they became a villain. And Alicia walks in saying, you tell me. Wait, what? I thought he was just talking narration for the audience. And that's why he was talking through the window of a building with a sign video arcade on it. But then Alicia walked into the room responding to what he was saying in a new black outfit. So I guess he wasn't inside an arcade, but his own home? I'm confused. This is the problem with always having characters talk to themselves out loud for narration in comics. Alicia attacks him and explains that she needs to fight someone who might actually fight back for a change, showing how miserable the Freedom Fighters are not having a real evil villain to fight. Why don't you fight criminals then? I'm sure they fight back. Unless Scourge and Miles beat the criminals so fast that they won't have a chance to, but that's why you split up. Scourge reminds Alicia of his meeting his good twin. He's talking as if Sonic's the only good twin he has, and characteristically lies that he set Sonic packing rather than admit that he was defeated. Scourge says that Sonic's everything he's not, and recites the Boy Scout oath, which is probably why he's saying ridiculous stuff like he, like he himself is not cheerful. Why does he say he's not cheerful? If Scourge is the arrogant type who expects everything to work out for him, that by, by definition makes him optimistic and therefore cheerful. How many pictures of Scourge are there that don't have him grinning from ear to ear? And thrifty? Again, this is probably just because he's saying the Boy Scout oath because Sonic? Thrifty? That means either good with money or cautious, the former of which I wouldn't associate with Sonic, I'm not sure why- I'm not sure where Scourge got the idea that Sonic is that way, or cautious, with, which Sonic definitely isn't. And the only reason I can imagine Scourge is saying this is because Sonic wanted to go back home the minute he first met him instead of sticking around. How would Scourge even know what the Boy Scout motto is so that he can assume that Sonic is that way to begin with? I don't even know what the Boy Scout motto is, I only know about it because of, I only know it's being used here because of a trivia page. That good guy is bad news. Why does he think he's bad news? And it's never explained. Scourge orders Boomer to get the motorcycles perfect for them because they're going to the Cosmic Interstate, which was magically left open for some reason. Sure is convenient for them that this magical portal to the Prime Dimension is left open. Why would a gangster gang that would logically pride themselves in looking menacing have motorcycles in all sorts of different colors rather than just black colored ones? When I picture evil twins riding motorcycles, vehicles like these are not what comes to mind. 
Especially since Patch's car is pink. Only the manliest of colors for him. Why the hell didn't he paint the car black instead? Why doesn't he have a motorcycle too? Why doesn't Alicia have her own motorcycle? Where the hell is Buns? Did they not meet her yet? Or is she sick at home from eating bad soup again? It sure was nice of them all to teach Miles how to ride a motorcycle so he'd actually be able to do it. Oh! Actually, he's riding in a green thing that's attached to Boomer's motorcycle instead, so he doesn't have to deal with that. That was sweet of them. But the most important thing is that these guys enter Mobius through a plot hole. A hole in the space-time continuum that was left to open for evil twins to go through for no reason. A literal plot hole. This is so contrived. I'm gonna bring up the zone cops again. Why the hell are they not closing this thing? If their job is to keep people from going to other dimensions and is causing trouble, they're doing a horrible job. It's almost as if the zone cops were made up at the last minute and create plot holes in earlier issues for not being there. We see that it took a pretty long time of the anti freedom fighters driving along the cosmic interstate to finally get to Mobius Prime. To the point where Miles is asking, are we there yet? Which was chronologically his first ever line. That's right, Miles Prower held us the mature and sophisticated counterpart of Tails. And his first ever line is, are we there yet? Literally the most stereotypical kid line ever. I just find that amusing. But anyways, they're taking a long time to get to Sonic's world, and I can't but wonder why Scourge isn't just running there since he gets there a lot faster. Okay, it's probably because he and Miles are the only ones who can run that fast, and they'd be leaving their friends in the dust afterwards. And since the rest of their friends are in on the plan, they just have to wait around for an eternity for them to catch up anyways. Plus, Alicia's riding on Scourge's motorcycle with him, and I guess that's what Scourge finds to make this all worth it. Why just run ahead when you can be held from behind by your girlfriend the whole drive there? He probably loves the affection. I'll get more into that later. I at least like that Scourge is saying he stole his map from a gas station a few miles back. We're actually establishing what he does as an evil twin, aside from arbitrarily fighting the good Robotnik. But even that is confusing. Why would the Cosmic Interstate have a gas station with a map in it? Who would want to be living or working in an in-between dimensions road at all? So they finally reach Mobius, and for some bizarre reason, Scourge knows an advanced vocabulary word that Boomer the Tech Genius doesn't. Boomer doesn't know what incognito means. Okay, I don't know if that's considered a big word, but still, Boomer's supposed to be the smart one. He should have a bigger vocabulary than that. I do love how this implies Scourge is slightly smarter than you think, though, with him using a word Boomer doesn't know. He tells everyone to disguise themselves as their counterparts by moving their leather clothes, and you know the rest. Alicia already has herself dressed up like Sally. Already. How the hell did she get those clothes that fast? It'd be fine if we were shown or told that Scourge got all the clothes for them with a super speed, but even then, it's not like he knows the secret stump entrance to Nuthole to be able to steal Sally's clothes for her anyways. Although Nuthole only being accessible by a secret stump entrance no longer even makes sense anymore anyways since at this point we're constantly being shown people living in houses outside rather than underground. Where the stump would lead to. Making me wonder how Eggman hasn't found the houses with satellites yet. It's like they gave up on having it make sense with the well-crafted underground hideout really early on. Meanwhile, we cut back to the actual Freedom Fighters, with Sonic, Antoine, and, and Tails emerging from a portal created by Rotor's Time-Space-Matter projector, which sent them into negative reality. They were trying to get into the Zone of Silence where King Acorn was thrown into by Eggman, because, you know, fuck roboticizing him or executing him, but they couldn't. I don't understand why Sonic would say that he'd rather be in Robotropolis, though, since we haven't been shown why that place they were just in was so much worse. Sonic insults Nicole in another jerk moment, practically calling her useless, and Nicole stands up for herself once again. So far we've seen nothing but Sonic and Nicole not getting along. Is Sonic seriously still holding a grudge from when Nicole gave him a minor shock to make him stop shaking her? He's worse than the pig was with Jeffrey! Either that's his problem, or Sonic just doesn't like AI. What a bigot. I do like this source of character conflict, though, as I get to see a more human side of Nicole with her standing up for herself and complaining, rather than just her being like, 
yes, Sally Master, all the time. And it creates more sympathy for Nicole as the underdog Sonic doesn't like yet. Nicole complains humorously that it's not her fault negative reality wrecks havoc with the software. Wish I got to see that. And says, next time, bring a compass. Yeah, because that'll totally help. We're not even told what exactly negative reality is like. I wish I'd seen that instead. But from what's being implied here, if it's a sort of wacky, magic-overloaded world, where physics goes so crazy that Nicole's software is being messed with, in a conveniently temporary way at that, I don't think a regular old compass is going to help, especially in a world that probably doesn't have a north and south pole to make it work. You'd think she would have figured that out. Sonic says that until everyone's ready to start a full-scale rescue attempt, he doesn't want to get Sally's hopes up. I guess this is the caution that Scourge was talking about, but still, Sonic isn't Sonic still isn't cautious in general. This was just a rare instance. And Scourge doesn't know about this. I really like this being introduced, how it's setting up what they're planning on doing later, saving King Acorn from his own silence. Antoine asks Sally how her mission with the trainees went to distract her when she walks into the room, and the text at the bottom of the panel references the Sally miniseries. Oh, so we actually have it explained when the Sally miniseries took place and why Sally wasn't warning her friends by being away from them. Apparently, her friends already knew about the trainees, rather than Sally doing everything in secret. That still doesn't explain why Sonic didn't try to help her to make sure she'd be fine, though. Everyone is spared from having to explain things to Sally when the mob of people show up at their door because of what the evil twins did. So honestly, the plan was a huge benefit to them for that reason alone. It gave them an excuse to not explain to Sally what they're doing. And again, arrived at their door. How is it possible that Eggman hasn't tracked down their house from satellites from above if they're just living in a regular house above ground? They used to be worried about trickle-down water technology locating the underground base and knot hole, and now it's like they don't even care. Sally makes a plan to lure their imposters to them, and we cut to civilians fleeing and hiding from the evil twins riding around in motorcycles. The Freedom Fighters lure them to them dressed as gypsies, with Sonic killing him and his friends for an instant. Also, all of the evil twins are wearing their sunglasses now when it was only scourged before. I guess they kept their shades in their pockets before this. And they think that now they don't have to disguise themselves because they've got the civilians thinking that heroes have turned evil for no reason, and so them changing to dressing like a biker game would make sense to the civilians. Sonic says he's wise enough to know that violence is the first act of the incompetent. That's so wise that's almost out of character for him. I wonder if he's quoting something like his Uncle Chuck there. Naturally, Scourge takes offense to being called incompetent and a fight begins, with Sonic being fast enough to dodge his punch. Better selves? Alicia, you sound like you're flat out admitting that you think the good twins are better than you. Maybe deep down she knows this and that's why that flipped out of her, what she was trying to say good twins. You wouldn't expect an evil twin to have self-awareness like that. You think she'd think she and her friends are the better ones. Scourge complains about being double-crossed even though he had no reason to trust Sonic to begin with. It's not like they were in an alliance. And Sonic says he was just playing by his rules. And we finally get a fight between the evil twins and the Freedom Fighters after an issue's worth of build-up. With Scourge starting it with an awkward and out-of-place line. As you'd expect, they're evenly matched. And the evil twins are the ones winning because they're fighting in a smart and practical way, rather than arbitrarily refusing to use the most effective moves. The two Sonics keep missing their attacks because they're too fast for each other, with Scourge not limiting himself to attacking at normal speed in a normal way now that he knows what he's up against. I'm sure this fight is pretty disappointing for Scourge then. Alicia insults Sally with a clever line of her hair being dyed red. Or at least it would be clever, but it's obvious that she dyed her hair red too. So that was stupid for it to say. Miles calls Tails twerp, an extremely petty insult for a wannabe gangster. As if he wasn't even trying. I can imagine he was capable of much more harsh language than that. Is this his first day at Trash Talk or what? It might add some depth to him, so I'm not complaining. I wonder if he's like holding back because of who he's facing with. Like, if he really wanted to insult Tails, he knows that he'd be insulting himself in the process, so it implies that he's really the smartest one of them all. And Tails calls Miles Shorty, 
So Tails is being just as stupid as Alicia by using an insult that would very obviously also apply to himself. Wait a minute. Unless Miles actually is shorter than Tails, even if only by a little bit that only Tails would notice. Then it would make perfect sense that Tails would call him short. The question is, what would make someone shorter than their identical twin? What stunts a kid's growth? Childhood malnutrition? Ouch. That certainly explains a lot. And while they're fighting with each other, Boomer says to Rotor as an insult, Think you're so smart? Without a question mark for some reason. Basically trying to imply that Rotor isn't as smart as him, and that he actually admits he's a genius. After Rotor calls him a smart milk, Patch insults Antoine for just standing there for not giving him a challenge, only to have his attack dodged. And Antoine explains that he's fighting in a safe and defensive way. Makes perfect sense for a coward. That's not an insult, that really does work perfectly as Antoine's personal fighting style. And it really speaks how useless Antoine's been at this point, that this is the first time we're ever seeing his personal fighting style. Sally being the smart one is the one that explains that they're being matched move for move, and Sonic agrees with her while pinching Scourge's cheek for some reason. And Sally gets the idea that switching opponents is the only way the Freedom Fighters are able to win. I like how worried and confused Miles looks here. And Patch, too. Normally you don't get to see them looking like that, because fuck adding depth to their characters. So now we get to see some more interesting matchups. Sonic punches Alicia in the face, and I like what he says when he does it. Explain to her why he hit a lady. It's a credit to the writing that Sonic isn't treated like he did something wrong for this. Sally has a funny badass line where she punches Patch below the right arm, sending him upwards while it's revealed that he has to wear a wig, just like Antoine, and Sally comments on it as a result. So, wait, hold up. Both Sonic and Scourge once burned the hair off their Antoine's as a prank? Which was the reason Antoine has to wear a wig, remember? Or maybe Patch lost his hair another way. We'll never know. If so, that makes Scourge have the moral high ground for once because Sonic did something even more dickish than he did. You think they jump at the opportunity to establish that yes, Scourge did that too. I find it really satisfying seeing this jerk get beaten by Sally. And a girl at that. That must have been humiliating for him. Antoine kicks Boomer in the head while calling him slow and clumsy, making reference to his being a swift fighter early on. Why would he ever consider himself to be a swift fighter when Sonic is always around? And Broder pushes Miles down like a typical schoolyard bully. Seriously, I know they're enemies in a fight, but that was barbaric and rough even in that case. You'd think he'd want to go easier on him since he's a kid, parental instincts and all. You'd think he'd rather, like, hold him still or something. Plus, I wouldn't be surprised if this hadn't happened to Miles already being pushed. I wouldn't be surprised if this was reminding Miles of something. Especially since kids in gangs could have a history of being bullied and rejected themselves. They, go they join gangs because it gives them a place where they can belong, where they can have status and jobs to do. And considering Miles is a mutant, if he wasn't bullied for it and the evil Mobius at that, I'd be very surprised. Well, at the very least, Porter has a decency to say, sorry, little fella. But the look on his face and what he's doing doesn't make that look very sincere, and I bet Miles thought the same thing. And Miles, after naturally doing an annoyed grunt, complains about being called little. So Miles being self-conscious about being a kid dates all the way back to his first real appearance. You think that if he was really arrogant and self-confident and stuff, he wouldn't care that he's a kid. You think he'd just shrug it off, brush it off, instead of being insecure about it by considering it to be an insult. And Tails attacks Scourge while having the advantage of being in the air and being behind him, so it makes sense that he'd succeed in the fight. And I really like his line here. Looks like we've come full circle, Sonic. But I don't like Scourge's line. Insisting on being called Mr. Sonic and calling him Mangy, all because he's fighting him as an enemy. Mangy means messy, filthy. Again, I had to look that word up, so Scourge using an advanced word. But yeah, messy. So since Tails doesn't look that way at all, I'm confused about Scourge wanting to use that particular word to describe him. Besides, Mr. Sonic just sounds stupid. Mainly because his last name is Hedgehog, so it makes no sense. Unless his full name is Sonic Sonic. And we cut to the evil twins being tied up with a rope and in a daze from the fight for some reason. I guess Sonic, off-screen, went and found some rope at Sonic speed. 
and ran in a circle around them to make them dizzy. Which was why he was able to tie them up and why they had these expressions. Wish I had seen that. Sonic says he doesn't hold a grudge against the civilians because he couldn't have known what was going on. Although he still calls one of them old timer, which is unusually rude of him, so maybe he still got some resentment. I won't blame him. Wait, Sonic's still holding Skirt still? I guess he dropped him or knocked him down before running to get that rope off screen, and then came back to grab him again. I like how the two Sonics both call each other handsome, as they both have an ego. It's in character for them, pretty amusing. I wish we got more of the interaction, though. And Skirt shows that he remembers his original goal, boasting that he got what he wanted. A fight. By the way, how do they send their evil twins back home? Does Rotor drive them down the cosmic interstate new vehicle? While they may daze the entire time? They look like they're high. It's not like they've been sprayed with a special gas or something, so why? This story was written by Mike Kandorovac and Ken Penders. While I at least appreciate how they bothered to give us a motivation for the anti-freedom fighters doing what they're doing this time, even if it's only for this specific incident. And I love how they're using the evil twins again for something, because this is a great concept in theory. Once again, we don't get any development on their characters and their backstories. At least not entirely intentional development. Miles certainly got some, with his clearly being the least evil of the group with his petty, chosen act and insult. But as I said before, I was more interested in seeing a story about what kind of adventure Sonic and his friends were having in negative reality than I was in seeing the evil twins mess around to provoke them into a fight. Them trying to wreck their reputations when that would have obviously only done temporary damage was completely unnecessary when all the evil twins had to do was show up and start fighting them. Like, I know that they're supposed to be evil, but that's not even necessarily- like, that's just stupid of them. Like, they're just wasting their time. I think the story would have been better if we saw the adventure in negative reality that justified Sonic saying it was worse than Robotropolis in the first place, and then we saw Scourge complaining about being bored and wanting a challenge, and taking his friends to Mobius for a fight. I really did like the actual fight scene, though. Rotor acting like a bully aside. It was really satisfying to see most of the evil twins get beaten like that, and in interesting matchups at that. I just wish it didn't make Scourge look pathetic in the process when he was repeatedly shown beforehand to be Sonic's equal and a formidable foe because of his super speed. In fact, we see right here that he's dodging all Sonic's attacks, so maybe that's why they couldn't get a satisfying fight in. Plus, the nitpick here, I don't see why the Freedom Fighters thought they had to disguise themselves to lure the evil twins to them. They would have fought them anyways. And I don't know why it's mentioned in the Archie Wiki that this was the first mention of Anti-Bunny because I didn't see her anywhere. Was she mentioned on Scourge's heart table? But, again, that just makes you wonder why she wasn't a part of the story. Why not explain why she wasn't a part of this? And why wasn't Bunny part of the story, couldn't think of it? Well, it'd be blatantly obvious Buns wasn't Bunny, because Buns isn't a cyborg. So I guess they couldn't take her along for the mission. But Scourge didn't know that. Scourge didn't know that Bunny was part robot. He hasn't even seen her yet. I like the story well enough. But this is the first story where I can get an easy sense of how it should have been rewritten from the ground up. 